Welcome back to Deep Learning. And you can see I have a couple of upgrades. Hmm. Upgrade. So we have a much better recording quality now. And I hope you can also see that I finally fixed the sound problem. So you should be able to hear me much better right now. And we are back to a new session where we want to talk about a couple of exciting topics. So let's see what I've got for you. So today I want to start discussing different architectures. And in particular, in the first couple of videos, I want to talk a bit about the early architectures, the things that we've seen in the very early days of deep learning. And we will follow then by looking into deeper models in later videos. And in the end, we want to talk about learning architectures. Instead of what humans might need, just dozens of examples, these things will need millions. A lot of what we'll see in the next couple of slides and videos has, of course, been developed for image recognition and object detection tasks. And in particular, two data sets are very important for these kinds of classes. This is the ImageNet data set, which you find in reference 11. It has something like a thousand classes, more than 14 million images, and subsets have been used for the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenges. It contains natural images of varying size, so a lot of these images have actually been downloaded from the internet. There's also a smaller data sets if you don't want to train with like millions of images right away. So there's also very important the CIFAR data sets, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100, which is 10 and 100 classes. And there we only have like 50K training and 10K testing images. The images have reduced size 32 by 32 in order to very quickly be able to explore different architectures, pros and cons. And if you have these smaller data sets, then it also doesn't take so long for training. So this is also a very common data set if you want to evaluate your architecture. Okay, so based on these different data sets, we then want to go ahead and look into the early architectures. And I think one of the most important ones is LULNET, which was published in 1998 in reference number nine. And you can see this is essentially the convolutional neural network as we have been discussing so far. It has been used, for example, for letter recognition. We have the convolutional layers where we have trainable kernels, then pooling, another set of convolutional layers, and another pooling operation. And then towards the end, we are going into fully connected layers where we then gradually reduce. And in the very end, we have the output layer that corresponds to the number of classes. We've been doing this for millennia. Yeah. So this is a very typical CNN type of architecture. And this kind of approach has been used in many papers, has inspired a lot of work. We have for every architecture here key features. And you can see here, most of the bullets are in gray. That means that most of these features did not survive. But of course, what survived here was convolution for spatial features. This is the main idea that is still prevalent. All the other things like subsampling using average pooling, it still used a nonlinearity, the tangens hyperbolicus. Yeah? So it's a not so deep model, right? Then it had a sparse connectivity between S2 and C3 layers, as you see here in the figure. So yeah, also not that common anymore. The multi-layer perceptron as final classifier is also something that we see no longer because it has been removed for, for example, fully convolutional networks, which is a much better approach. And also the sequence of convolution pooling and nonlinearity is kind of fixed. And today we would do that in a much better way. But of course, this architecture is fundamental for many of the further developments and I think it's really important that we are also listing it here. The next milestone that I want to talk about in this video is AlexNet. Here you find the typical image. By the way, 
you will find exactly this image also in the original publication. So AlexNet is consisting of those two branches that you see here. And you can see that even in the original publication, the top branch is, is cut in half. So <laughs> it's a kind of artifact that you find in many representations of uh, AlexNet when they refer to this figure. So the figure is cut into parts, but it's not that severe because those two parts are essentially identical. And one of the reasons why it was split into two sub networks, you could say, is because AlexNet has been implemented on graphical processing units. So this is implemented on GPUs and it actually was already multi-GPU. So the two branches that you see on the top, they have been implemented on two different graphics processing units and they could also be trained and then synchronized using the software. So the GPU is of course a feature that is still very prevalent. You know everybody today in deep learning is very much relying on graphic processing units as we've seen in numerous occasions in this lecture. It had essentially eight layers, so it's uh, not such a deep network. It had overlapping max pooling with a stride of two, size of three, and it introduced the ReLU as nonlinearity, which is also very, very commonly used today. So also a very important feature. And of course, it is the winner of the 2012 ImageNet challenge, which essentially cut down the error rate into half. So it's really one of the milestones uh, towards the breakthrough of CNNs. Ooh, AI. What else do we have to combat overfitting? This architecture already used a dropout with a probability of 0.5 in the first two fully connected layers, and it used data augmentation. So there were random transformations and random intensity variations. Another key feature was that it has been employing mini batch stochastic gradient descent with momentum 0.9 and an L2 weight decay with a parameter setting of five times 10 to the minus five. And it was using a rather simple weight initialization, just using a normal distribution and a small standard deviation, which we have seen much better approaches already in the previous videos. What else is important? Well, we've seen that the separation is a historical reason the GPUs at the time were too small to host the entire network, so it was split on two CPUs. Another key paper, I would say, is the Network in Network paper, where they essentially introduce one by one filters. This was originally described as a network in network, but effectively we know it today as one by one convolutions because they essentially introduce fully connected layers over the channels and we use this recipe now a lot if we want to compress channels and we fully connect over the channel dimension. So this is very nice because we've seen already that this is equivalent to a fully connected layer and we can now integrate fully connected layers in terms of one by one convolution and this enables us this very nice concept of the fully convolutional networks. So it has very few parameters shared across all the activations and then it introduces this global spatial average pooling as the last layer and this is essentially the birth of fully convolutional neural networks. Another very important architecture is the VGG network, the Visual Geometry Group of the University of Oxford and they introduced very small kernel sizes in each convolution and the network is also very common because it's available for download so there's pre-trained models available and you can see that the key feature that they have in this network is that they essentially reduce the spatial dimension and they increase the channel dimension so step by step and this has this gradual transformation from spatial domain into a let's say for the classifier important interpretation domain. So we can see the spatial dimension goes down at the same time we go up with the channel dimension and this allows us to gradually convert from images and color images towards meaning. So I think the small kernel sizes are the key feature that are still used 
It was typically used in 16 and 19 layers with max pooling between some of the layers with stride 2 size 2. Learning procedure was very similar to AlexNet, but turned out to be hard to train. In practice, you needed pre-training with shallower networks in order to construct this. So the network is not so great in terms of performance, has a lot of parameters, but it's pre-trained and it's available and therefore this has also caused the community to adopt this quite widely. So you can see also when you work with open source and accessible software, this is also a key feature that is important for us in order to develop further concepts because parameters can be shared, trained models can be shared, source code can be shared. And this is why I think this is a very important instance of the networks that you find in the deep learning landscape. Another key network that we already seen at quite some occasions in this lecture is GoogleNet. And here we have the Inception V1 version that you find in reference 14. I think the main points that I want to highlight here is that they had very good ideas in order to save computations by using a couple of tricks. So they developed these networks with embedded hardware in mind and it also just features 1.5 billion multiply add operations in the inference time. So this is pretty cool, but what I find even cooler are these inception blocks. So in total it had 22 layers and a global average pooling as a final layer, but these inception modules are really nice and we will look at them in a little more detail on the next couple of slides because they essentially allow you to let the network decide whether it wants to pool or whether it wants to convolve, which is pretty cool. And another trick that is really nice are these auxiliary classifiers that they used in earlier layers in order to stabilize the gradient. So the idea is that you plug in your loss into some of the more early layers where you already try to figure out a preliminary classification. And this helps really with building deeper models because you can bring in the loss at a rather early stage. Yeah, you know, the deeper you go into the network, the more you go to the earlier layers, the more likely it is that you get a vanishing gradient. And with these auxiliary classifiers, you can prevent that to some extent. And it's also quite useful if you, for example, want to figure out how many of those inceptions modules do you really need, then you can work with those auxiliary classifiers. So that's really a very interesting concept. So let's talk a bit about those inception modules. And by the way, the inception modules are, of course, something that has survived for quite some time and it's still being used in many of the state-of-the-art deep learning models. So there's different branches through these networks. There's like only a one-by-one one convolution, a one-by-one one convolution followed by a three-by-three three convolution or a one-by-one one convolution followed by a five-by-five five convolution or max pooling followed by one-by-one one convolution. So all of these branches go in parallel and then you concatenate the output of the branches and offer it to the next layer. So essentially this allows then the network to decide which of the branches it trusts in the next layer and this way it can somehow determine whether it wants to pool or whether it wants to convolve. So you can essentially think about this as an automatic routing that is determined during the training. Also interesting is that the one by one filters serve as a kind of bottleneck layer so you can use that in order to compress the channels from the previous layers and then you can compress and then convolve. Still, there's a lot of computations if you were to implement it exactly this way. So the idea is then that they use this bottleneck layer in order to essentially compress the correlations between different feature maps. So the idea is that you have this one by one filters and what you do is instead of running, let's say, 256 input feature maps and 256 output feature maps with a 3x3 three three convolution. This would already mean that you have something like 600,000 multiply add operations. So instead you use this bottleneck idea. So you compress the channels from 256 with a 1x1 one one convolution to 64. 
then you do on the 64 channels the 3x3 three three convolution and then you uncompress essentially from the 64 channels again to 256 and this saves a lot of computations so in total we we'll need approximately 70,000 multiply add operations here and if you look at the original 600,000 multiply add operations then you can see that we already saved a lot of compute time. Also because I'm lazy. Okay so these are essentially classical deep learning architectures and we want to talk about more sophisticated ones in the second part and there I want to show you how to go even deeper, build deeper layers and how you can do that efficiently with for example other versions of the inception module. So thank you very much for listening and hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye.